Do it harder. Do it harder. Amen. Good evening, everybody. It's good to see you on this Sunday evening. Let's grab our songbooks, and as we stand, please, let's go to number 66. We'll sing the first, second, and the fourth verse of At Calvary, number 66, At Calvary. Number 66, join me in the first. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. By God's word at last my sin I learned. Then I trembled at the law I spurned. Till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon that was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary on the last. Now I give to Jesus everything. Now I gladly own him as my king. Now my rapture soul can only sing of Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Amen. Aren't you glad about Calvary? Amen. What a great work that was done for us there. Amen. It's good to see everybody. Hopefully everybody had a great afternoon. Amen. Let's, uh, let's bow our heads and pray and we will get started this evening. Brother Enos, could you open us up in prayer, please? Amen. You may be seated. Turn over to number 258. Number 258. We'll sing the first, second, and the fourth verse of Christ Receiveth Sinful Men. Number 258. Come in the first. Sinners Jesus will receive Sound this word of grace to all Who the heavenly path will leave All who linger, all who fall Sing it o'er and o'er again Christ receive a sinful man Make the message clear and plain Christ receive a sinful name. Come and he will give you rest. Trust him for his word is plain. He will take the sinful last. Christ receive a sinful name. Sing it o'er and o'er again. Christ receive a sinful man. Make the message clear and plain. Christ receive a sinful man. Christ receive a sinful man. Even me with all my sin. Purged from every spot and stain. Heaven with him I enter in. Sing it o'er and o'er again. Christ receive a sinful man, make the message clear and plain. Christ receive a sinful man. Amen, amen, amen. 
Those who are tuning in via the live stream, the camera has an issue, so uh, there is no picture tonight, so if you could just bear with us. I uh, found that out after we started the live stream, so uh, if you could uh, just bear with us. But um, what a great day we had today, uh, having Father's Day. Uh, anybody have any blessings that you would like to share on uh, maybe this week or something that happened to you today, how the Lord blessed you? Amen. Anything you want to praise the Lord for? Yes, Caleb. A warm day. Amen. He's been out there. Uh, he's been out there catching butterflies out in the backyard, doing a good job. That's right. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Yes, sir, Brother Tony. Amen. That's great. That's great. That's great. And you were sharing uh, yesterday about uh, um, share that about the coworker, the, uh, the atheist, the atheist, the atheist. Yeah. He was there. Listen to the gospel message. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. The Lord's been working on some folks, uh, the hearts of folks there at his plant. So praise the Lord. What a, what a great opportunity. Amen. Praise the Lord. Brother England, you had your hand raised? Where is it located in Waterloo? Uh, it was at Daddy's house. Okay. Okay, okay. That's the Marshall? Okay, yes, yes. That's great. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Amen. Sounds like y'all had a fun time. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Brother Tompkins. Great. 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 That's a blessing. <laughs> yes. Yes. How'd it go? Oh, have it. Oh, okay. He's going to stay there the whole day, right? He's going to be there tonight, right? Flying home tonight. Okay. Wow, that's great. What major town is Tahlequah near? Because I've been up through the Indian Nations Turnpike, but and I recognize the name of Tahlequah, but is it in the south? Okay, 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 all right. Neat, neat. Anyway. Maybe when I was in Fort, is it near Fort Smith? Uh, um, okay, because that's the east. Amen. Good. Amen. Amen. Well, good. I'm happy for him. I hope hope it went really well and he gets home safely. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Have something? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Amen. 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 Definitely, Definitely be praying for that. Amen. Anybody else? Something you want to praise the Lord for? Any fathers? I know, uh, the pastor, you, you got to have a good time with your sons yesterday, right? Yeah, but you have to work together. As a, that's, that's right. That's exciting. Good memories. Memories made. Happy for you. Happy for you. That's great. Amen. Anybody else? All right. If not, then let's grab our psalm books. We're going to go to number 145 as we stand in preparation for the scripture reading to follow. Number 145. It is well with my soul. We'll sing the first, second, and the fourth verse of number 145. Enjoy this song as you sing it. Number 145. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roam, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, well, well with my soul, it is well with my soul, it is well, it is well with my soul, though Satan should buffet. No trial should come. Let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Let's sing the third verse. My sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin in part but the whole is nailed to the cross and i bear it no more praise the lord praise the lord oh my soul it is well with my soul It is well with my soul. Sing it out on the last. And Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sighed. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend, even so it is well with my soul, it is well with my soul, it is well, it is well with my soul. the Lord. Let's grab our Bibles at this time. We're going to go to the book of Philippians. Philippians in the New Testament, Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to ask Brother Tony if he would come and lead us in our scripture reading from Philippians chapter 3. Good evening. Open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3. We'll be reading verses 1 through 21. Philippians 3 verses 1 through 21. I will begin and you respond accordingly. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. 
Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ? Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend, that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded, and if and in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 21 together. Who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for gathering us here together on this Sunday evening, Lord, as we gather around your word. Now we just ask that you speak to our hearts. Challenge us, Lord. Reveal things in our heart we don't have right with you that we don't have right with others, that we don't have right with, in our, with our family members or neighbors or co-workers or, or our boss, Lord. We want people to see Jesus Christ in us, Lord. We also want to have fellowship with you, Lord. And we know if we don't keep our sins confessed before you, that we're breaking our fellowship, Lord. So we, may we have our sins confessed tonight. I'd ask you to use our pastor, Lord. Use him as, as, as a rod, as a staff of the word, Lord, to, to penetrate any stoniness in our, in, in our hearts this evening, Lord. And uh, fill him with the power of the Holy Spirit as he preaches and teaches to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. What a powerful passage of the Word of God. I want us to concentrate, though, on our text verses in verses 18 and 19. It's a parenthetical statement, but it's like a side note that Paul puts in this passage. He says in Philippians 3, verse 18, it says, For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Heavenly Father, I praise and thank you, Lord, for a chance to bring forth your word. I ask that you please, that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit. I need your help. Lord, lift up Jesus. May he receive the honor and the glory. I just behind the cross of Jesus. Would you please send your Holy Spirit? You promised that you would be with us if two or three were gathered in your name, and we're gathered here together tonight in Jesus' name. So we're asking you to please be here with us, speak to our hearts, find in us fertile soil in our hearts that the seed of the word can be planted in and it can do the work. That we can all come to 
the perfect image of Jesus Christ in our life, in our spirit, in our actions, everything about us, we reflect Jesus Christ because of the work of the Word of God in our hearts. We need your help. We need your help, Lord. You have us here on earth. You haven't called us home to heaven yet because you still have work for us to do and you have still work on us to do. So I'm asking you to please do that work tonight through the Word of God. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have you ever had uh, questions come through your mind that nobody has an answer for? Just a little preface to the message. Well, I came across a list of questions that no one can answer. Okay, so here's, here's some questions, all right? What disease did cured ham have? In the, in, the, in the deli, they have cured ham. Well, all right. What's the difference between unique and very unique? Brother Tompkins. <laughs> I mean, if it's unique, it's unique. Anyways. All right. Here's another question. When we put in our ten, two cents worth, right? But we only get a penny for, the thought, for our thoughts, right? Where does the, where the, where does the other penny go? <laughs> Here's a great question. When do you come important enough to be considered assassinated and not just murdered? <laughs> I don't know if anybody's ever tried this, but can you cry underwater? And, and can you cry in the ocean, under, under the ocean? It's the same thing. <laughs> Here's another intriguing question nobody has an answer for. Who decided that uh, round pizza should go in a square box? Funny things. When you get to heaven, are you stuck in eternity wearing the same clothes you were buried in? <laughs> All right. Why did we put a man on the moon before we realized it would be a good idea to put wheels on our luggage? Have you ever thought about that? Why? <laughs> the wheels and everything else, why not the luggage? All right. Um, why do toasters always have a setting that burns the toast. Right? It should only toast it, not burn it. All right. Uh, here's another great question. Why does grass grow where you do not want it and not grow where you do want it? <laughs> this, is, this is a great question. I can feel it. Why do, why do we say we slept like a baby when a baby wakes up every two hours? <laughs> That's the truth, amen? I can feel it, amen. Why do we pay to get to the top of, building, a top of a tall building, then pay to use binoculars to look at something on the ground? <laughs> you ever thought about that? It's like, that is a good question. Here, here's an here's a interesting one. If a deaf person goes to court, do they call it a hearing? <laughs> you know how a deaf person gets tongue-tied? Anyways, okay. Um, we, we say, it's all Greek to me, but what do the Greeks say? It's all Chinese to me, I guess. <laughs> Why does Goofy stand upright and Pluto stand on all four when they're both dogs? Have you ever wondered that? Those are, these are just profound spiritual questions we've got going on here. Here's another great question. On Gilligan's Island, the pre professor could make a radio out of a coconut, but why couldn't he fix the hole in the boat? <laughs> Here's another great question. If Wiley e. Coyote had enough money to buy all that stuff from Acme, why doesn't he just buy himself dinner? Can you drive in the carpool lane if you're driving a hearse with a corpse in it? I don't know. Try it. Tell me how it goes. Why does a dog get mad at you if you blow in his face, but then he'll stick his head out the window when you take him for a car ride? That doesn't make sense, does it? And uh, one final question that's going to rack our brains. If we don't care that Jimmy cracked corn... Why do we still sing about it? 
You ever, you ever hear that song, Jimmy Crack? Or not? Why do we still sing about it? Amen. Amen. A little funny uh, humor there. Let's go to our text chapter and let's look at Philippians chapter 3. It says, verse 1, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Paul is closing out, or at least he's trying to close out his letter. If you'll just glance over at chapter 4 and verse 8, he again says, finally. It's like one of those long closings. Finally, 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 finally. See, he's a typical Baptist preacher. In closing, <laughs> what do they say? Um, the three lies of a Baptist preacher. Um, five more minutes, I'll be done. In closing. <laughs> Anyways. So he's trying to close out his, his, his letter, leaving them with some practical pointers for the Christian life. He says in verse 2, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of concision. You wonder if he was looking into the future to soul winners in the United States of America that would be in Sharon Township when they go door knocking, beware of dogs. <laughs> I think he was referring to what Isaiah was, had, had said in chapter 56. The prophet Isaiah, he called the false prophets and the irresponsible leaders of Israel, he called them dogs. If you want to jot this verse down, Isaiah 56, verse 10, it says, His watchmen, meaning the leaders, remember that God had told Ezekiel, I have set thee a watchman over the house of Israel. He's talking about the, the leaders. His watchmen are blind. They're all ignorant. They are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark, he says in Isaiah. He says, sleeping, lying down, loving to, loving to slumber. Verse 11 of Isaiah 56 says, yea, they are greedy dogs, which can never have enough. Wouldn't that fitly describe a false prophet, an irresponsible leader? One that they don't bark, they don't, they don't make noise, they don't do their job, and yet they're constantly wanting to consume and consume. It seems that the apostle was referring to what Isaiah had to say about that. The antagonist, antagonists to the gospel of Jesus were viewed as dogs because of their malice against faithful professors of the gospel of Christ by barking at them and biting them by, by bothering the, those who would propagate the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul says to this church, beware of dogs. He also said, beware of evil workers, beware of concision. They urged human works in opposition to the faith of Christ. That's an evil worker. When you're, when you're urging uh, works that are in opposition to what the scripture says. He says, beware of evil workers. Then he says, beware of concision. He, he calls them the concision as they that tear and rend in pieces the church of Christ. He says, beware of them. Verse 3, he says, for we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Verse 4, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any, man, if any other man thinketh that he hath, whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of, he, of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuted in the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. He's going through his different qualifications before he got saved, the clout he had, he says, if, if anybody had a reason to be confident in the flesh, I was, I, I was number one. I was, I was the, the highest ranking Pharisee among that religion. He says, I was circumcised the eighth day. I'm of the stock of Israel. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. Concerning the law, a Pharisee, that was a very high rank. Concerning zeal, in the pharisaical realm, persecute in the church these heretics as they saw them. Concerning the righteousness which is in the, which is in the law, blameless, impeccable character according to that religion. Paul had more to glory in, in a religious sense, than all the other dogs aforementioned. They were never as religious as he had been. But look what he says in verse 7. He says, but what things were gained to me, 
of those I count a loss for Christ. What those things that were gained to me, Paul enjoyed much gain in his pre-salvation life. But he was still empty inside until he found Christ. Look at verse 8. Yea, doubtless, and I can't count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. Paul suffered much loss because of getting saved. Because of, I, I encourage you, if, if you have a chance to read testimonies of Christians in persecuted parts of the world, people who come to Christ in the Middle East, in the eastern part of the world, where the gospel of Jesus Christ is persecuted, it will, it will help you appreciate the salvation and the freedom that you have as, a, as an American Christian. Many of these folks, they, they have to, they pretty much are putting their necks on a guillotine when it comes to saying, I profess my faith in Jesus Christ. It means death for them. It means persecution for them. Paul was saying the same thing. He says, I have suffered the loss of all things, but look what he thought of it as. And you count them but dung, trash, worthless, that I may win Christ. Christ was worth it to him. Christ was worth it. He says that I may win Christ and be found in him. Not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of, of God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. It, by any means, I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. Paul was glad to trade all of his gain, trade it all away for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. He willingly threw away his old life and all its trappings. Can you imagine the financial benefits that he threw away to, to be a Christian? Can you imagine? But he said, I count him as dung. I count him as trash. Christ is worth it. Christ is worth it. All to win Christ to himself. He wanted to be so close to Jesus that he, that, that, that he would be found inside Jesus. Did you, did you see that? It says, that I may win Christ and be found in him. I want to be so close to him that I'm, I, I, people find me in him. He wanted to be so close to Jesus that he would be found inside Jesus and robed in Jesus' righteousness, not his own. Verse 10, he talks about, Wanting to know Jesus in a deeply and intimate way. Know him. Know his resurrection. Know his sufferings. Know the love that compelled Jesus to suffer those things for an unworthy human race. What compelled Jesus to do what he did for this unworthy human race? I want that kind of love, Paul said. That's, that's what I want. That's, the, that's how fervent I want my relationship with Jesus to be. People, Paul wanted to die like Jesus did for others, for others. Look at verse 12. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count my, not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul was willing to, was still striving to be all he could be for Jesus. Paul has been saved for almost two decades at this point in time. If at least 15 years, and he's still striving to be all that he could for Jesus. Amen. I don't know about you, but I, we should never stop striving to be everything we can be for Jesus. doesn't matter if you've been, say, 50 years. We should all be striving to be everything that we can be for Jesus. Paul's inner fire was to pursue and arrest Jesus, to apprehend him. To be so close to him, to be locked up, handcuffed to him. Just like what was happening to him in the world. He was being pursued and arrested for Jesus' sake. He's, what does he say? That I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. I want to be that close to Jesus. Just like my enemies are trying to be close to me and put me in prison, I want to be that close to Jesus. 
Paul admitted that he hadn't quite arrested Jesus yet in this spiritual sense. But he was doing all he could, including forgetting his past life and reaching as far as he could forward to catch Jesus. And then he says in verse 14, I press toward the mark of the pri for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I remember hearing this verse on Thursday night soul winning clubs as a five, six, seven year old little young man in the Olympians. You could probably look up a missionary called Alan Barkley. Alan Barkley, missionary in Mexico. He led our Olympian clubs, and this was the theme verse. Amazing, amazing. If you ever have a chance to teach children, I encourage you to, to, to hammer the Word of God, hammer Scripture into them. It will affect them for the rest of their lives. But Paul was saying here that he pressed forward in his mind, in his heart, in his spirit for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. What was that prize? It was the prize of being called faithful. I, wanna, I want that title of faithful. Can you sense the inner tenacity in Paul? Verse 15, it says, Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. That word perfect is not impeccable or sinless. It means mature in Christ. It means grown up in Christ. Let us therefore, as many as be grown up in Christ, as many as be mature in Christ, be thus minded. Be, have the same way of thinking. And if, any, and if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. He implored those who were perfect, those who were complete, those who were victorious in Christ Jesus, mature in Christ Jesus, to think, to think the same way. He stressed for them to be this way, to be Christ-like in other areas areas of life too. God would reveal that to them. God would point out, hey, you could grow in this area too. And so you're constantly working at different areas to grow them all to the stature of Jesus Christ. Verse 16, nevertheless, where to we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. Verse 16, he says, if there is an area where you have gotten victory, where you have attained, walk by the same rule. Be mindful of the same thing. What? What? Be mindful of what thing? Verse 14, pressing toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of Christ Jesus. Be faithful in it. He's pretty much telling them, don't, ju don't just live your Christian life to reach a pinnacle and then come down the other side. No, make it a plateau. Make it a new floor for yourself. When you attain it, well, then, then press towards the call of the prize of the high calling of Christ Jesus, of being called faithful. Be faithful. Be consistent at it. Don't just get there to be able to think good of yourself and then descend back into depravity. No, make it your new floor. Anyone can attain, but can you sustain? That's, that's, that's one thing. As a, as a young person, I, I had a, a, in the sports world, I had my, my favorite teams, and, and I, I'll hope for them to, to win. And these, these teams that always won, I was like, man, they're always winning. I want my team to win. But as I grew, grew, grew older and I started studying these perennially relevant teams and how hard it was for them to get back to the top and maintain a high level of performance, I started respecting it more and more. The, the, the coach that retired this past year, Coach Saban, 17 years of being relevant and dominant in his field. That's hard to do. Oh, you can be a coach Ogeron of LSU who has the greatest season in the hundred and some odd years of LSU football and then go, go a 500 afterwards and get fired two years after the greatest season. How's that? He attained, but, but then he dropped off. But to keep that high level of performance, that's tough to do. That's what Paul's saying. Don't just, don't just be a one and done. Don't, you, don't be a one-shot wonder. No, faithfulness. Keep reaching. Keep, keep hitting that. Sustain. That's faithfulness. Be mindful of that. Faithfulness, Christians. Verse 17, he says, follow my example and follow those who are following our example. 
Mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. Be followers together of me. Skip down to verse 20. We'll get back to verses 17 and 18. Verse 20 says, for our conversation, or in other words, you could say our walk. It could be your talk, but it could also be your walk. They speak. For our conversation is in heaven. For whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Our walk here on earth should be a heavenly walk. It should be a heavenly walk. Every step that we take, it should be something that looks for Jesus everywhere. Where people, they, 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 they may not even be able to, to, to have a conversation with us, but they can tell we're walking a heavenly walk. That's what he's imploring to these Christians. Now let's go back to our text verses, verse 18. It says, For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Remember in verse 17, he said, Mark them which walk so, like us. He says, Brethren, be, ye follow, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so, as ye have us for an example. And then Paul, as a side note to them, gave these believers some food for thought, regarding others that did not walk as Paul and those following him and his example walked. He wanted to bring a spotlight upon them so that they would be able to detect which way they were going. He said to the Christians, I'm walking this way. Other people who are walking this way, I want you to mark them. I want you to follow them. But I want you to also be able to detect those who aren't walking this way. Because sometimes they walk very close together and it, it takes, it's hard to discern that they're off just a little bit. So I, I want to give you some, some food for thought on how to spot them. He wanted to bring the spotlight to them. Pretty much he said here, here are some idiosyncrasies of an enemy of the cross of Christ. And if you'll mark these, these details, these criteria in your mind, you will be able to pretty much detect when you've got an enemy of the cross of Christ in your presence. Go to verse 19. It says, whose end is destruction. Whose end is destruction. The first thing you can note, ab note about this enemy of the cross of Christ is that their end is destruction. He was simply warning the believers about people walking in a way contrary to Christ. Their end is destruction. There's a couple ways you could take this. It reminds me of a psalm in Psalm 73 where it says, Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had, had well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bands in their death. And there's, but their strength is firm. They are not troubled as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride compasses them about as a chain. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than their heart could wish. They're corrupt. They speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouths against the heavens. They, their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore, his people return hither, and waters of a full cup are wrung out of them. And they say, How doth God know? And is there any knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain, washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say, I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the children, the generation of the children. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me until I went to, into the sanctuary of God. Then understood I at their end. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou castest them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation? As in a moment. They are utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream when one waketh. So, O Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. 
Thus my heart was grieved, and I was pricked in my reins. So foolish was I and ignorant. I was a beast before thee. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by my right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go a whoring from thee. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord that I may declare all thy works. An idiosyncrasy of an enemy of the cross of Christ is that their end is destruction. Their end is destruction. Just because they're enjoying a little pleasure today and a little little uh, 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 fruits of their labor today or a little uh, 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 of the riches of the world today, it doesn't mean that they're going to win in the end. Yeah. Don't let it discourage you. This psalmist said, I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. But until, until he went to the house of God and saw and understood their end. Their end is destruction. An enemy of the cross of Christ, their end is destruction. Here's another way to look at it. Their, the end of their reign is destruction. Oh, yes, they are having a good time now, and they are reigning and they are in charge now, but it's the end, the end of their, the, the after effect of them being there is destruction. The end of their reign is anarchy and rebellion and revolution. What they leave behind is anarchy and rebellion and destruction. Their end is destruction, both to themselves and everything around them, but they don't care. They don't care. That's when you know that you're in the presence of an enemy of the cross of Christ. One who is all about themselves. Their end is destruction. What else does he say? What else? What is another idiosyncrasy of an enemy of the cross of Christ? Look at verse 19. It says, whose end is destruction. Whose God is their belly? Whose God is their belly? They worship their gut. Literally and figuratively. Everything they live for, everything they live to do is to consume, consume, consume. We live in a society of consumerism, don't we not? We live where consume, consume, consume. These enemies of the cross of Christ, their God is their belly. All they want to do is consume everything they live for is to satisfy their carnal desires. Everything they live to do is to satisfy carnal desires. There's not spiritual desires in their heart. And if there are spiritual desires, it's tainted with carnality. What does James 4 say? Verse 1 says, For whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members? You lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have. Desire to have and cannot obtain, you fight in a war, yet you have not, because you ask not. You ask and receive not, because you ask amiss, that you may what? Consume it upon your own lusts. Their God is their belly. The God is their belly. That's an idiosyncrasy of an enemy of the cross of Christ. They worship their flesh and its carnal desires. If it feels good, I do it. I'm not going to think about if it's a stumbling block. I'm not going to think of it and how it's affecting other people. I don't see anything wrong with it. It's a very shallow way of thinking. Galatians 5, 17 says, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary with the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. They live their life in a sensory way, in a way that pleases the senses, but not in a spiritual way. Matthew 6, 24 says, No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Yeah. That mammon could be the money of this world, the riches of this world, or it could be your God, uh, the, 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 your belly God, your appetites. You can't serve God and mammon. If the belly is God, then God can't be. 
an idiosyncrasy of an enemy of the cross of Christ. Look at verse 19 again. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their valley, and whose glory is in their shame. Whose glory is in their shame. Think about that phrase. They glory. Number three, their glory is in their shame. Meaning, that which they should be ashamed about, that is what they glory in. Don't we have that living in our society today? These, these groups for Palestine, these, these uh, 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 transgender for Palestine, for these, uh, these homosexuals for Palestine, like, you're, you're nuts. You're nuts. Go ahead, and, go ahead and go over there. See how they treat people like that. They don't deal with that. They, they don't put up with that kind of stuff. That which they should be shamed about, they glory in. There's no, there's no, there's no blush in it. Look in, the, look in the Bible at what God calls a shame. These enemies of the cross, they glory in that. Jeremiah 6, 7, 6, 15 says, Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore they shall fall among them that fall at the time that I visit them. They shall be cast down, saith the Lord. God gave us those reactions to warn us. He gave us the blushing reaction to warn us for our conscience to, to say, step back. This is not right. But they don't even listen. Don't even listen. They can't even blush anymore. They've done crossed so far over the line with God. Their glory is in what they should be ashamed about. When man fails to heed the warnings of our conscience, that warning of feeling ashamed, that warning of blushing, we're headed for big trouble. We're headed for big trouble. When God can't, can't move in our conscience and he can't cause our heart to grieve, when our, our heart and our soul and our spirit are so seared and so hard against the Holy Spirit, what else can he do? but let our bodies hurt with the consequences. He gave us those reactions to warn us, to let us know, I'm not happy with that. Maybe you ought to pause. Maybe you ought to talk to me about this. But when you start glorying in your shame, you're definitely becoming a more open enemy of the cross of Christ. What's another idiosyncrasy of an enemy of the cross of Christ? Look at verse 19 again. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Who mind earthly things. Their end is destruction both to themselves and everything around them. They don't care. Their God is their belly. They're all about pleasing the appetites. Their glory is in their shame. No more blush. And they mind, their mind is firmly focused and filled with earthly things. It's all about what can I get. First John 2 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the love of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away. Why in the world would you be in love with something that's going to pass away? Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt. Send it on ahead. Paul said, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. He was so in love with this world. Some people interpret that he was in love with the riches of this world. Sometimes I wonder if, if he was in love with living in this world. Was Paul, was his life threatened in Demas? He wasn't ready to die for Christ yet, so he forsook Paul because he loved living in this present world. Good question. A space rocket's trajectory is called its attitude, and if it's just a fraction off, it'll miss its target. Did you know that? If it's just a fraction off, it'll miss its target. Because when you multiply it, multiply that angle of, that angle of launch over millions of miles that are in space, it exacerbates the error. <clears throat> When a Christian's attitude, when a Christian's trajectory is just a little off, their life will miss being like Jesus. So again, what did Paul say were the idiosyncrasies of, the, of an enemy of the cross of Christ? He said, their end is destruction. 
both to themselves and everything around them. They don't care. Chaos is in their wake. As you're, when I was a child or a teenager, I would go out fishing with my papa buddy. And he had his little flat bottom boat, or he had a, a bigger boat, and he would get on the water, and he would crank down the, the throttle, and, and we would be zipping across and hitting those, hitting those waves. And I would always inevitably look behind me, and, and you see the water folding in, reacting to the propeller that, and what it's doing underneath. And then you see, as you're, as, you're, as, as you're looking out the back of the boat, you see the water spreading, 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 spreading. And if you're ever on the shore and you see a boat comes by, go, boat comes by, come by, eventually, if you're there on the shore playing or whatever, you start hearing the lapping of the water which is a result of the boat that just passed by. That's called the wake. Of course, I know you knew that. But for an enemy of the cross of Christ, what is left behind them and what spreads out and touches lives that they don't even know is destruction. Instead of it being a blessing, it's, it's destruction. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. They're all about pleasing their appetites. Their glory is in their shame. They've lost their blush. We need to be careful that, that as God's children, that we don't use, lose our blush. And their mind is firmly focused and filled with earthly things. They're focused on the wrong thing, and over time, they miss the goal of being like Jesus. Philippians 2.5 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Paul implores the Christians, think like Jesus thought. Think like he thought. Verse 15 of this chapter, our text chapter, what does it say? Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, as many as be complete and mature, be thus minded. What minded? How are we to think? Go back to verse 14. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God of God in Christ Jesus. We're to be thus minded to press toward that prize of the high calling of Christ Jesus. We're to strive to attain unto the walk of Jesus and then walk it faithfully. It's not just attaining, it's making it a lifestyle. It's consistency. It's setting that as our new floor. And we're going to go up from there. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the Apostle Paul and the words that you gave him. I pray, Lord, that you please. Lord, help us. Help us as your children. Help us to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. I pray that you please help us, Lord. Like Paul said, even though we may have attained or gotten victory in certain areas, may we press toward the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, that of being faithful being consistent, constantly looking for areas where we can improve, where we can be more spirit-filled, where we can be more Christ-like, where we can, we can have a better testimony and a stronger impact for Jesus Christ. Please help us, Lord, to never be satisfied with where we are, but constantly be striving to grow. Lord, please help us. And I pray, Lord, that you please guard us from these idiosyncrasies of an enemy of the cross of Christ. Lord, just because we've been saved for a long time doesn't mean that these things couldn't crop up in our own spirits. Help us, Lord, to be careful. Help us, Lord, to be careful. Help us, Lord, to, to be careful what we worship. Make sure it's not our belly and our appetites, but it's you and you alone. 
I pray, Lord, you please help us, Lord, to be more like Christ and to be hungry to be more like Christ. I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Let's all stand, please. Come on, Miss Melissa. Play hymn of invitation. The altar's open. Let's pray. Start with Blue Swamp, we can go to number 324, number 324. We'll sing the first and last verse of Draw Me Nearer as our closing hymn, number 324. Draw me in the first, number 324. I am thine, O Lord, I have heard thy voice, and it told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to Thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, 
to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. There are depths of love that I cannot know till I cross the narrow sea. There are heights of joy that I may not reach till I rest in peace with thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding sign. Amen. Amen. King Asa is a man who comes to mind where he had a good first 14 years of his reign, but then he had 20 years of peace. And all that fighting and all that good that he did in the first four years were undone. First years were undone in the 20 years of peace. And he started crossing lines and he started, his heart started drifting, became an enemy of that which was right in the end. And uh, may we be careful. May we be careful and have a hunger, have a, a fervency to want to be closer to the Lord and to realize that it could happen to any of us. If we're not careful, we just have to always be on guard. Satan, he wants, he, wants to, he wants to trip up God's children. And he'll use anything. He'll use anything. So may we be careful and take this warning and, and to learn from it. Amen. Amen. Well, let's bow for prayer and we'll be dismissed. Brother England, could you dismiss us in prayer, please?